Hi everyone and welcome. This is week six and we are going to be talking about SQL. This week we are going to be talking about the use of SQL in a database, some of the advantages of using a query language like SQL, and we are going to talk about the basic breakdown of a SQL query. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is how to get data into a database. So usually when we're talking about databases, we want to be able to find a way to import data into them. One of the easier ways to do that is either a text or a CSV file. So a CSV or comma separated value file is a good way to be able to upload your data into a data database. One of the ways that you can do that is actually if you have your data stored in a spreadsheet, you can export it from the spreadsheet into a CSV and then upload it into your database. If you're using SQL, you can actually create tables and insert into your database. So if you are trying to create a database and you don't have a lot of data to import, you can insert data in there. Depending on the database that you're using and the front end that you're using, you may be able to create a graphical option for this, um, use a graphical option. So some databases have graphical user interfaces or GUIs and you might be able to upload your data that way. You can also write a script to upload your data or enter your data into a database. Now, depending on the system that you're using, the interface for your database may look different. You may be using a graphical user interface or GUI, or you may be using the command line. So you can see on the left here, this is an example of a GUI. It has um, buttons that you can choose. Sometimes there will be drop down menus, um, but basically you can interact with it and it's going to be for most people a little bit easier to interact with. You could also have a command line version of your interface, which is what you see on the right here. This is an example of accessing um, MySQL on Ubuntu. Um, technically, this is MySQL Monitor, which is slightly different, but this is fundamentally what it would look like if you're going to be accessing a database on the command line, except it would probably say SQL instead of MySQL. And what would happen there is you would type in each of the commands or queries that you want to use, and you would do that instead of having buttons or drop-down menus. Now, when we're talking about the data in the database, we can have data that is stored and we can have data that we're accessing. So there are a lot of different front end options. There's a lot of different GUI options. They are all likely to have different steps. So when I say front end GUI options, that's the way that we would be accessing our database using that, those pictures. Depending on the program that is being used for this, it may look different. Um, each of the steps may end up being different. It's a little bit like if you were trying to do something in Microsoft Word and then you were trying to do the same thing in Google Sheets. Technically, they're both text editors, but the way that you might do something might be a little different. That's just the front end. The actual paper that you've saved is being stored somewhere and that's where the data is actually being stored versus like where you're accessing it. Um, another important thing to mention is something called a dashboard. A dashboard is something that we may set up if people need to see the data but not change the data. Dashboards are actually very commonly used in businesses when we want to have lots of people see the data and have access to the data without actually changing it. Databases will save information on your computer, but where that is being saved on your hard drive depends on the database that you have installed. The database installation process, if you don't already have one installed on the computer, um, can sometimes be less than smooth, um, and there's a lot of different options for getting that set up. Another way that we could do this is actually set up a database on a server or in the cloud. 
So that would be like saving all of our data somewhere else, and then we would be able to access it using a front end. So the data wouldn't actually, the database wouldn't actually be saved on our computers. It would be getting saved on a server or something else. One of the things that's kind of nice about that is it means the somebody else would be dealing with the installation process and you would just have to deal with creating the database. Um, it can also be kind of nice because if you have it on the cloud or a server somewhere, you could access it remotely from other places. Whereas if you just have a database on one computer, it's a little bit less portable. Um, in general, few people would change the data, many see the data. So usually if we are going to be a database administrator, we're going to want to lock down how many people can actually change our data. Um, basically, you want to be very untrusting about this because the likelihood of problems is just way too high. And so what will end up happening is you might have a couple of people that will go through some variety of training or process and then they would get access to be able to actually modify the data as in insert or delete records. However, there's a lot of people that would want to just see the data and they don't necessarily need the same training because they wouldn't have the ability to change it. They're just viewing it. Now, example of some front ends. Um, so you can actually do a build your own or roll your own front end, but a lot of people will actually do things like um, just use a solution that's already out there. There's actually quite a few different companies that specialize in front end and dashboard type options. And you can pay them based off of either the size of your database or the people that will be accessing it or how much help you want. Um, front ends can be as simple or as complex as you like. Some are free, some are not. Generally, this is the kind of thing where the easier it is to install, the more expensive. Um, the prettier it is, the more expensive. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, some front end options, especially when we start getting into some of the dashboards, will actually become incredibly complex and can allow for some analytics and visualizations. So like, for example, if you use Tableau, um, I'm using that as an example just because I've used it several times, not because it's better than any of the others or anything. Um, I should say, I've used it several times recently. Um, so with Tableau, what will end up happening is instead of writing a query, hey, please tell me all of the students that are taking a class this spring and have more credits to go. Um, I would actually be able to do more complex stuff with it. And I can actually set up things like, you know, scripts that will be all of STEM students. And it will still fundamentally be SQL queries, but they're done in a graphical way so that you can basically click the options that you want, um, either little check boxes or uh, things from a menu, and it will allow you to do some more visualizations as well. So like you can have, you know, make yourself a chart. These are all of the people that um, registered for classes versus the people that haven't type of thing. But there's a lot of people out there that do have database front ends and dashboards. I've just listed a couple as examples. Data dictionaries. So data dictionaries is how we can describe the data that's in our database. And it's a way of being able to make sure that the data that we're talking about is clear. Now, when I've been talking about some of these examples in the past, a lot of them are already very straightforward. So if we look at the book example, that one's very straightforward. We have a book title, book author, publication date, genre, that kind of thing. Those are all very clear and distinct. And I think that without too much thought, we could all agree on what those definitions are. Like, what is the book title? I think we could all easily look at a book and find the title. The data dictionary 
could be used to describe exactly what a book title is and where it is. However, it really comes into play and shines if you are able to either have um, an active dictionary or a well-updated passive dictionary. And it's basically like documentation for an explanation of what each piece is. Now, let's say for example, I'm talking about students. Now, if I just said that I have a column that's students, you might think that's clear, but it actually might not be. So a data dictionary would be able to explain what I mean by student. Do I mean current student as in registered for the semester that we're in? Do I mean student as in they have access to an EDU address? Do I mean student as in they are registered for a class in the past school year, like the 23-24 school year type of thing? Um, do I mean student as in like they were a student with us at any point in time? And a data dictionary would be able to specify what type of student it is that we're talking about. Data dictionaries should be centralized so that everybody is using the same definition. This is why clarity can be an issue. Because if I have a piece of data and I say, um, you know, student, well, if I mean student as in registered this semester, I would need to note that so that anybody else that adds to this would be able to mark them as student. Whereas like maybe if they were registered last semester but not this semester, I would have them marked as previous student. And then I would want a different entry in my data dictionary that says previous student. And I, I will say, having worked with quite a few databases, um, that example is actually a lot better than some of the others that you may see in industry. A lot of the times, the names that are listed in the columns are absolutely horrendous and you have no idea what somebody is talking about, which is why the data dictionaries are important. Active dictionaries um, are created within the database and auto-updated. Passive are separate and must be updated manually you are probably actually not really going to know which one you have and um, you may or may not see people using it a lot. It's, it's kind of weird in my opinion because why wouldn't you want to know the type of data you have and if it's being updated, but whatever. Um, but if you are going to be working with a database, it's important that you know what data you're talking about and what we actually mean by that type of data or by that column, like what should go into that column. Or row. Now, SQL, structured query language, which we have talked about very briefly, is used to view, organize, and manage data. SQL commands can also be referred to as SQL queries. They can be done on the command prompt and will look like commands. They can also um, actually be done through some of the GUI options. There's actually some dashboards and front ends that will allow you to bypass a lot of the GUI options and will actually pull up a text box or a prompt for you and you can enter in your SQL commands there. So being able to run the SQL commands by themselves, not just learning how to use a GUI, is actually a really valuable skill because once you start getting familiar with that, that's actually easier to transfer between different programs. So if you're at one company and they're using one front end and you, you move to another company and they're using a different one, it's likely that SQL will work, will work in both. So if you know how to do SQL, you'll have um, sort of faster uptime. Um, SQL is relatively human readable. Now, I say relatively because it's possible that you're going to look at it and it, you're going to think that it's gobbledygook, and that's okay. Um, but in terms of programming languages, it's one of the more human readable ones. And once you start getting used to it, it's actually really not too bad. And it's a lot faster to get used to than some of the other options. You can also write scripts so that you can automate things and do some of this faster, which is really nice because um, if you can do stuff faster and easier, why wouldn't you? So. SQL is pretty interactive, so you can actually see your results pretty fast and make sure you're looking at the right info. So if you run a SQL query and you realize you messed it up, which is a relatively common occurrence, you just got to be okay with it, um, 
you can fix it pretty much. Uh, it's close enough to programming. It's actually really easy for a lot of developers to pick up very quickly. Um, so it's got a pretty decent learning curve for that. And it's kind of this cyclical, because it's popular, people learn it and use it. Because people learn it and use it, it makes it more popular. So because it's been around for so long and because a lot of people have been using it for a while and it was standardized and everything in the 80s, um, it's actually a really popular option. So that's one of the reasons why it makes it really good to learn. Um, it's also relatively dependable because people have been using it for so long and it's been tested in some relatively harsh conditions. It's pretty dependable to use and uh, quite a few people have used it quite a lot over the years. Um, now, another note is once it's set up, a company is unlikely to move away from it. One of the things that you might notice once you get to industry is once a piece of technology is set up and working, companies are generally very reluctant to switch away. There have to be very good reasons to switch away. It's one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of situations. Um, Another thing that makes SQL really popular is a lot of people use it that aren't necessarily tech people. So while it is true that programmers can pick it up pretty quickly, a lot of other people can pick it up pretty quickly as well. So some larger companies will actually have free training courses so that anybody in the company has the ability to go and learn SQL so that they can get access to their data. Most companies are pretty willing to make sure that you have the data that you need for your job because if you can get better data you are more likely to be able to do your job better and make them more money and companies like money. SQL the brand. So SQL was standardized in the 80s and if we're talking about SQL as a language I would say that there are different dialects of the language. So they are similar and the way that they're being used is similar, but there's going to be just enough differences that you might um, get confused. So one of the things that I actually always recommend, and this is true for all of the languages and the power tools and everything I teach, is um, familiarize yourself with the syntax and don't feel bad about double checking syntax because it's basically impossible to have all of the syntax for everything in your head at all times, especially if you're switching between languages. If the only thing that you ever do is SQL, you're probably fine. But if like you're switching between versions of SQL, it can be easy to get them mixed up. So SQL Server is proprietary and owned by Microsoft. Some dialects of SQL could be Postgres and SQL Lite. For example, Postgres is actually open source and for object-oriented databases, we've been talking about relational. Um, Postgres can actually also take JSON, so that's a little bit different as well. Um, so you can see that MySQL and Postgres actually have some differences. So like you might end up seeing some differences in the quotations. So MySQL could do single or double quotes, whereas Postgres would take single quotes only. Um, you might end up seeing some similarities where there's just they, the commands look exactly the same. Um, sometimes you'll see some differences like the things that are built in, like current date. Um, that function might look a little bit different. So that's what I mean by just, you know, looking up the syntax. So if we look at a basic SQL query, the general form is going to be the same. And when we make it more and more complicated, we're just kind of adding on stuff to it. And you'll notice some similarities as that happens. So each table in our database has fields. Each record has a row and a column. You have to know what you're looking at to form the query. So you have to know what's available to ask your question. Each SQL query is going to include commands, um, these like reserved words. Some examples of reserved words are going to be like select, update, insert, delete. But you can see what I mean. They're actually relatively straightforward. You know, it's 
I'm sure you can guess what insert and delete do, for example. So you figure out what you want to do first, and then you translate it into a query. So let's say I want to look at all customers in our database. Then I would say select splat from customers. Select is just saying the thing I want to look at. Splat or the star means everything. From is literally where the info happens to live. And customers is the table that we're pulling from. So my full statement would be select splat from customers and that would show me the customers table. Now, one of the best ways to start learning this is to go try it. So what I would like you to do now is to go try some SQL. Now, if you are a complete beginner, you have no programming, you're a little bit nervous about it, that's completely and totally fine, go to the W3 schools, try that first. After you've done that, or if you're already relatively comfortable with programming, try either the Adventure Island or the Crime Solving Challenge that I've linked and see what you think about those. Those are going to be a little bit more complex and assume some uh, knowledge that you may not have. If you don't have it, that's completely fine. Start with the W3 schools first and then do one of the other ones next. And hopefully that will help give you some of the start so that you can start practicing what it's like to run some SQL queries. I hope you are all having a lovely day.